Yes, dear Gülçin, dear Hans, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, a nice name that we carry. It's really our name. And what you see is our new logo of the company. And I'm particularly proud of because it will be published tomorrow morning. Uh, so we will go live with a new intranet and uh, people will will see this, uh, maybe bit, be a bit surprised, although it's just a rebranding. And we only changed one letter. Well, you might guess which one. It's the O. Before that, uh, the O was like a packaging, very geometrical, very edgy, and now it's round. And uh, with this, we want to show and symbolize that uh, we want to make in our company, the move from a product-oriented company to a circular economy-oriented company. And this is uh, rather easy in our case, because what we do, you see on the top left, is uh, we collect waste paper. We actually call it recovered paper. It's not waste. And then out of this, used paper, we produce new paper, which you see on the next uh, picture, these rolls. And out of these papers, we produce packaging. It's corrugated cardboard. So each step is a very nice transformation from one product into the other. So on the top right, you see the corrugated board and all the things that you can also produce out of it, uh, mostly displays, for example, at the POS. And corrugated board is a wonderful product to do almost anything. So we want to close the loop and uh, permanently add value in this circle. And that's why this logo change is happening. Now, I was asked to um, talk about uh, bureaucratic encounters of an entrepreneur, and I have to build up myself a little bit because it's not really a nice topic that I was given by Hans. Um, so let me do this in front of you because first of all, um, we have to build up ourselves as, as being strong enough to, to carry to bear these encounters. And in our case, I can say uh, I'm a happy entrepreneur because something very particular happened in the second half of uh, the 20th century. And I do hope your memories are, are still so good to, to remember it really. And that was uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that's, uh, that was a very important happening, a kind of a miracle still, looking back. And I was particularly enthusiastic about it because our products, corrugated board, are very regional products. They are light, they are voluminous, and um, they cannot travel too far because they are also cheap, unfortunately. So a truck loaded with corrugated board, that's a couple of thousand dollars and you cannot uh, yeah, carry it too far away. So you need the markets, the local markets to, um, to be successful. And I was always asking myself in my studies in St. Gallen, where I, by the way, also met my wonderful wife, Elizabeth, uh, where are the markets of the future. And carrying such a question with you in the 80s, of course, gave then the answer at the end of the 80s. So actually, uh, if you have a very low time preference, then you can also be patient to, to wait for the answers. And in my case, I think that was the reason why I was so enthusiastic in the end of the 80s when I saw what's happening. And um, these were the new markets opening up. So corrugated packaging is needed when there is a retail structure that needs transportation between production to the retail, from the retail 
to the private household. And this is, in a way, it was a no-brainer for me to, to see this opportunity. So in the beginning of the 90s, uh, 30 years ago actually, I celebrated my 30 years in August, uh, I, I went to Czech Republic and uh, I was successful to buy a state-owned company at that time. And I think we were only successful because at that time the reigning premier minister we talked about was Václav Klaus in Czech Republic, uh, and he considered himself as a, as a very liberal politician, which I would say is also true, although I heard other stories. Uh, but as a liberal politician, he was absolutely convinced that he would be elected out of office in the election that happened in 92. So he was really hurrying uh, the privatization process. Uh, and I remember I was in a hotel in Prague uh, negotiating day and night to, to get the privatization process in this case done before these elections, the 10th of July in 92, happened. Uh, I think we signed the contract on the 2nd of July. And, uh, well, the good thing was that the government was re-elected. That was a bit the, the miracle. But still, it was for us the entry in a new market. And today, we operate seven plants uh, in Poland and in Czech Republic alone. So when I started in the business, we had two plants in Switzerland. That was it. Today, we have 15 plants in five countries. And I would say the most power and energy, or you could also say as a sailor, the back wind was given through this opening of new markets because it, yeah, basically it was a no brainer that these markets would develop in the sense that we have seen in the mature markets like Switzerland, Germany, I mean, West Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and so on. So, this is just to say that this gave us, so to speak, the, the size and the capacity to endure what is today's topic. And I just took uh, some examples just of this year because I, I could actually make the, the whole seminar for four days to tell you about bureaucratic encounters uh, because there are so many. So I just took the last uh, let's say a couple of months' events in 2021 that, yes, that we had to endure. Maybe a, a last remark as an entrepreneur or a happy entrepreneur is also a fact that we could remain private. So that is a, a very important distinction between a public company and a private company. So I could prevent um, my family or my uh, predecessing generation family to go public because that was the plan uh, soon after I entered the company, but I could prevent it. I found some uh, nice banks who gave me some credit to pay out the, the other generation and to remain private. And uh, basically, uh, me and my wife, we, we bought our company through our whole life. So we really made it private. You know, in families, they also tend to become bigger and they tend to become kind of public. So if there are dozens of cousins and siblings, then uh, the character of the company might also change. So it doesn't have necessarily to do something with being public at the stock exchange and being private as a family company. It can also depend on the number of shareholders. And in our case, we are just two shareholders. And uh, so I am chairman and CEO. That's a constellation that would not be or almost not possible from a corporate governance uh, perspective in public companies, if you're chairman and CEO, that's heavily criticized if it's ever happening. Uh, but in our case, I, I do not follow these 
rules, so to speak, and my wife is, is country manager Switzerland. So today we, we operate these 15 plants in five countries, that's Switzerland, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, and Croatia. And uh, we employ uh, 4,650 people. Now, what are the things that we encountered uh, this year? First point, equal payment of salaries. So there is, uh, that's a, a thing not only in Switzerland, but there is a law uh, in Switzerland published 1995. Uh, I must look it up. It's called, in German, Bundesgesetz über die Gleichstellung von Frau und Mann. So it's a federal law about the equal positioning of male and female. In a way, for us, it's, it's a ridiculous and unimportant thing because discrimination uh, of sex is, I mean, that's no issue in a company. How would it or could it be? In a company, you are interested to have the best person in the position. And you are, as an entrepreneur, certainly not so stupid to, to make a distinction because you would limit your choice if, if, you, if you do a female-male distinction. So it is, it is something that is absolutely, of, it's, it's nonsense, it has no value for us. It, and we are sure and we know that we do not uh, discriminate uh, sexes. I mean, simply because we are not stupid to do it. But, but the legislator sees it differently. So they, they have uh, maybe a born distrust that you're doing such things. So what we have to do is make an analysis about the salary, uh, you know, of female and male. And we have to pay, of course, that analysis. And the analysis gives some kind of, um, it's, it's a stupid analysis, by the way, because it's a, a purely uh, quantitative one. Um, so what it basically does is if a job holder has the same title, male, then it is compared with a job holder, the same title, female. But it's just the name of the function. It, it's not saying anything uh, qualitative or quality-wise about the job. So whatever result comes out of this analysis, it will not reflect uh, something like reality. Because um, in, in our case, you could have, or you, the result was, yes, we have difference in salary between male and female, but it's, it's kind of arbitrary. And when you, when you go into the details, you find out, well, for example, in production, and we are heavily producing uh, paper, corrugated board, and so on, uh, then female do have a little disadvantage. Well, it's obvious. They cannot carry as much load. Um, very often they are not so quick or, um, I mean, look at Tim. I mean, <laughs> there is a certain difference between, between him and the, an average female, you know, worker in production. So this difference remains and <laughs> so to speak, we feel sorry for the difference, but of course, uh, it reflects also in salary in production. Now, when you go to office jobs, then when you go in detail, then you see, ah, there are um, less people reporting to a female officer than to a male officer. So we have a difference in, in uh, responsibility. And it's just a result out of, out of reality, not out of any discrimination. So, it's, it is something that causes cost, this analysis. Then you have to justify the analysis, make a second analysis, 
about the results of the analysis, and it's a ridiculous thing uh, ending nowhere. Unless, if it's, if it's really big, the differences, the auditors have to make a remark in the auditor's report, imagine. So that's why I, I put here in brackets, are auditors basically civil servants? Because you pay the auditors and then they, you know, have to make a remark that you do not pay, for example, female workers the same salary as male workers. Uh, in our case, I think it can be prevented in a, in a private company. It's not so a big issue and uh, because we are not so vulnerable. You can imagine if, you're, if your stock is, is traded in the stock exchange and there is a remark from the auditor that you are discriminating, basically your, your share price is coming down. In our case, we are a bit uh, relaxed because we don't care about our share price because there is none, basically. Um, another element about uh, this non-discrimination is a thing, a, a very ridiculous thing, is about candidates. So let's assume you have a, a job and you have 10 candidates. I mean, mathematics shows that you can only take one out of the 10 candidates. So nine are, can, can feel potentially discriminated. Um, and this is a danger, by the way, and this is also kind of used if a candidate is refused. And then this candidate is asking for a written um, argumentation why he or she was refused. Then you know one thing, there is a lawyer beside. You immediately know it because Basically, you are not asking for a written argumentation for your refusal. You might call, make a telephone call. Uh, can you say, ah, there were 10, where, where was I? Was I number two, three, four? There could be a natural interest in, in getting these informations. But when they want a written argumentation, then you know, watch out. There is a lawyer. And uh, the funny thing in this uh, law is, I, I read Article 6, um, well, I, basically I can't read it in German, but uh, it, the title is, um, in German it's Beweislasterleichterung. So, easening the, the proof um, obligation, easening how you prove your discrimination. So basically, it's an invitation to sue. Because um, it says, if a person can, can give evidence of discrimination, we, we say it is discrimination already. I mean, it has not to give uh, a necessity to give further proof. So this is in a way, uh, it's ridiculous. And I'm, I'm not too upset about it because in reality, uh, please correct me, Elizabeth, but I, I think uh, we do not have cases. We were never sued until today, although there is a written invitation to do so uh, in, in practice. So one can say this legislation is so ridiculous that there is still such a, a strong common sense in reality that it is not used. But I, I have to add, uh, two of our three children are working in the company and the third one is a lawyer and she's working for us outside the company. And now you know that she has quite uh, some work to do so, for example, we, we have in HR the necessity to have a written, pre-written document so that if a candidate who was refused, we can send just a written document by a lawyer, of course, why he or she was refused. So this is the kind of work that our third kid 
is doing outside the company. So uh, besides extra costs, there is nothing, no gain out of it. Second point here, job references are written by the judges of the labor courts. Well, this is something most of you might know. But there is an interesting story, a uh, journey about this uh, phenomenon to be told. And it's a funny, a funny story. So first, an employer wrote a job reference when the person left the company normally. Now, there were, of course, some job references who had some harsh words in it. Let's say, let's assume we are in the 70s, the, the good old times. <laughs> uh, there were some harsh words, and, um, and the job reference was a bit of a problem for this uh, person to find a new job. So he claimed that the wording should be changed. And that was normally an issue in, front, in, in labor courts. And then judges started to, you know, do the changes. So it was written by the judges, the, and they were and are very clever people. David, huh? lawyers are very clever people. I mean, in wording, they are perfect. So they changed these job references, and instead of being frustrated, the employers started, you might know it, to encode the job references. So there is a code, a hidden wording in job references. No, still today, by the way, that's surprising that it could survive so long. So it's kind of a funny game about the wording. So then um, this coding came up, uh, and I give you the the example you might know, three levels. The lowest level is, this person was working to our satisfaction. Second level, this person was working to our full satisfaction. Highest level, this person was working to our fullest satisfaction. So that was in a way, a code that you still find today in the job references. What it means is, to our satisfaction, means hands off. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of, I think it's just funny because the meaning is so different from the wording. So, to our satisfaction, hands off. I mean, this is a horrible person. Uh, to our full satisfaction means hmm, mediocre. Uh, you really have to look into, into the case thoroughly to employ this person. And on the contrary, to our fullest satisfaction, that's really bingo. That's really a person that, that we can uh, say yes. Now, the funny thing is how many years it took the, let's say, the labor courts, the judges, and the people to find out about that code. <laughs> I think it took, I would say, at least about 10 to 20 years to find out. And then, of course, they attacked these codes in the labor courts. So that was the next stage of, let's say, degeneration of wording. Uh, and then the next step of this war, it wa it's a word war, W, -W word war, um, was that the employer started to say, uh, gave his job reference, and then on the bottom in asterisk, this job reference is not encoded. But the funny thing is that you very often could still find these codes. And then many did not, you know, they believed the asterisks and they didn't find it. And uh, let's say my, 
my experience from 2021 is I still find almost 50% of that code codes in job references. That's funny. So in a way it was not sufficient because the employee employee has to fight, of course, every job reference in the court. And it's, it's an internal fight, although it's a bit easier for them than for the company, uh, because the lawyer's costs are lower than for the company. But still, it is a fight, an internal fight, and there is no, no basic result out of it, unless one could say, nowadays, don't read job references too seriously. I always read them, of course, to find the code, but uh, you cannot be prevented from calling the, the references on the telephone. And still, on the telephone, you will, you will get more truth, but maybe in 10 to 20 years, even the telephone calls will be surveyed and then published and and went to court. That's a, a bit of dark fantasy, sorry for that, but at the moment it's not yet true. We know that, uh, of course, the Americans, for example, I would say all governments are surveying telephones, but they, they do it to, uh, with, with words. So like bomb, they would probably you know, find out about the conversation. And I assume that with the digitalization in 10 to 20 years, the word job reference would also <laughs> then uh, evoke some surveillance. But that's a bit uh, a dark joke. Sorry for that. So this is also a loss, of course. It's a loss of information and it's a loss of value uh, concerning job references, but I do not have to complain too much about it because it is your duty to do a full diligence concerning a candidate to, to have your own judgment still. And you still have your means and your possibilities to do so. Now the third thing is, a, is probably the weirdest I have to tell you about, the taxation of a yard exchange between neighbors. So I happen to be president of our um, pension fund. The pension fund in Switzerland is taking care of the savings of the people. And uh, this pension fund, in our case, owns many, many apartments on a big plot of land, very close to our, uh, so to speak, home factory in Switzerland. Now the neighbor came to me and said, ah, I have such a thin stripe of land, and of course I know the neighbor, uh, couldn't you give me five meters additional? I give you in a side line of the neighborhood, I give you the compensation. And what we can do is we can improve the land size, both of us, to our advantage. And it was a very good proposal, and um, we basically accepted, of course, no. there are many details about it, uh, to, to build in Switzerland is very complicated, but what we did is a completely square meter new, neutral exchange of land. So we gave them 500, and he gave us 500. So, we never talked about money. We never talked about the valuation of the land. We just made an exchange of, in a way, goods. It was land. And its neighborhood, I mean, you can assume that the valuation of the land is anyway the same. And we could, yes, we could improve our situation just through this exchange. Well, three weeks later, I got the bill. And yes, you can blame my naivety. <laughs> and you know what happened. I got a bill for, um, what's the name? Real estate profit. Because that land was built, uh, was, was acquired by the pension fund some 40 years ago. So the land price was something. And today, 
the land price uh, increased. But I was asking myself, what, what's the basis of this tech real estate profit? Because there is no profit. There is no money involved, no valuation. Well, I can spare you the details, but of course bureaucracy has found a way. So what they did is they did the evaluation. I mean, we never did the evaluation, but they did it. And they said, well, yes, of course you have exchanged the land, but one part of the exchange is that you sold the 500 square meters to the neighbor. You know, you sold that, so they kind of, they separated the whole exchange into selling and buying. So a completely artificial, let's say, procedure, of course we know why, it it's has purely fiscal reasons. So I must say I was once again surprised by, well, innovation, I don't know, but I mean, it needs a, a certain thinking, you know, to, to really enter into that transaction and, and gain a, a taxation out of it. it maybe it's an, an interesting thing for you just to, to get more aware of the spirit of the bureaucracy. That's it's really interesting. I cannot dive too much into it, it hurts too much, sorry. I, I, I jump to the next point, uh, which is, which is a, a not a nice one, but yeah, work out. Yeah. Now I changed the country to, to Germany. Work out the anecdotes. Um, we have four plants in Germany. One is that uh, has less than 200 people, so we have no work council. Uh, and three are, are bigger, and they have work council. Now, of the three remaining plants, uh, we have two very, I must say, reasonable uh, work council. Reasonable means we are not against work councils, because they are basically a communication platform to the people. So we even have kind of a work council in Switzerland, which has nothing to do with trade unions, by the way. Well, it can have something to do, but it doesn't have necessarily something to do with it. And there's only one left which where we have troubles, and that's uh, not only based on the law, but of course based on the people. But how law is abused, um, we see in this case. Now the work council has some rights that are basically frightening. So one right is it can refuse your request for extra hours. That's probably the, the worst one. So you have a work council, in this case it has 10 members. We have 500 employees in that plant and the 10 members of the work council can say at the request of the management, no, we don't make extra hours. Why it is so stupid in a way is that extra hours are paid extra. And not only one to one, but with an increase of 25%. So basically to make extra hours is attractive. And you have, also in this plant, people who would love to make extra hours. But their work council, representing the people, is saying no. Again, you see a bit the spirit of this social institution. That's the spirit. So they are the bosses of their members. And they have, by the way, corals internally, of course. If somebody wants to, you know, earn this extra money, which is quite a good incentive, I would say 25%, he cannot. 
that in this case uh, we have this world? Well, in detail, we really have a quarrel, we have a legal quarrel, and we go to court, and this is of course nothing that an entrepreneur likes, because we are particularly proud of our culture, of our collaboration way, of our way how we communicate, and so on. And here, yeah, what can we do? So, um, we are very privileged in our business concerning demand. We have over-demand. People in COVID times are buying stuff at home. They need boxes. Now we have another phenomenon, uh, plastic replacement. You know that. What is the alternative? Corrugated boxes. So we have, I'm really a happy entrepreneur. So we have high demand unless we have a work council that is not prepared to make extra hours. Extra demand would ask for extra hours. Now, um, what in this case is, is particular is now we can prove that the work council is doing harm to the company because we have uh, customers who complain about our late delivery. And they, uh, one customer, a big one, is thinking about suing us because of our late delivery. And the late delivery causes costs at the side of the customer. And um, of course, we are proud that corrugated boxes are so important on the journey of the goods. And uh, if, if you don't have boxes, you basically also have to stop your production. So we are at the very heart of, of the whole supply chain in the economy. So we have a certain understanding for that customer, but it doesn't help us. But we have proof that the work council is now damaging the company. So the legal case is going on, unfortunately, and it's... Uh, it's completely against our sincere will to, you know, to bring forward the company to the benefit of, of everybody. So maybe, uh, I hope Hans is not asking for the same uh, task next time, but maybe I can give you an update next time of how this court case is, is uh, continuing. This work council has also extra uh, rights in terms of employment and, and, uh, and giving notice to people. So all these cases have to be uh, uh, given in front of the work council. What they also can do is they can have um, internal um, uh, seminars so that they can learn about their rights, how to sue the company, basically. And, and, um, and they have the right to, from the law, imagine from the law side, they have a right to have three weeks uh, of seminars in four years, three weeks. And now the judges again have changed the law. So we are in, in that company at an average of three weeks a year. We have 11 members in the work council and we, had, we have heavy machine stoppages because of the absence of these people. They are also free to, to choose their hotel where the seminar is, um, is taking place. So it is high valued uh, hotels with wellness infrastructure and at the very uh, furthest place in, in Germany. So the distance of these hotels is, is more than 300 kilometers and it's a wellness infrastructure hotel. So this is a, a bitter fact, but uh, let me go to the next topic, it's just too bitter. Uh, well, this is not a big issue, GDPR, you know, that's a EU le legislation. Uh, it, Basically, it's not so bad, but it's a bureaucratic monster again. So the employee has to give consent to the usage of, of 
their personal data, which is, you could say, which is okay. It just creates additional stress. So what we as a group of companies have to do is we make contracts between all the companies in the group because an employee could sue us when another sister company is using the data where he's, I mean, imagine for example, the publication of his name in the internet platform uh, which is of course a non-practical case because there we would show the names of the top management and top management is not suing us, that's great. Uh, so that we don't have a problem, but imagine that such a name would be published in the, in the um, internet, the group internet website. So we would need the consent to all kinds of usage. So that's why we have internal contracts between all group companies that such a usage is allowed. Of course, it's a bureaucratic thing. Another element that our, our lawyer daughter is, is developing so we can have these internal contracts. Okay, gender neutral language is in, as such quite uh, ridiculous, you know, again, wording, wording is changing. In, in Germany, we are forced to, when we publish a job, uh, to say male, female, and diverse. So, uh, in Switzerland, we are not yet forced to, but we have a lot of pressures from our HR to also do it, and we've, we think it's kind of funny. It's not, it's not so bad. Now let me come to the, to the last bureaucratic encounter. I, I show here the a picture of, of our model hof. Uh, yes, it's an opera house. Uh, and um, it was inaugurated in 2012 as a result of my, let's say, soft secession, thank you for the, for the word I learned yesterday. I did a soft secession in 2004 in front of um, community leaders of the Canton Thurgau and I uh, founded my own state. And the result of this activity in 2004 was the building of that house, which was, uh, I started in 2009 and the model of is now uh, our management um, uh, schooling. Uh, it's an opera house, we have operas here. Next month, Rahim, we will have the, the Free Private Cities uh, initiative hosting here with a public event. And what happened was last Monday, so just a couple of days ago, I, for the first time, had to welcome the people coming to a speech, by the way, Hans was doing the inaugural speech, so to speak, in 2012 about free private societies. That was a great event. Uh, so I welcomed the people in um, the Modelhof for the first time as I here welcome you in Avalon. Avalon is this, this, the name of my soft secession. Well, I didn't do it just as an advertisement, I had to do it. Why? It, uh, this Monday was the first day when the federal government of Switzerland pushed through the obligation to carry a certificate with you when you go to a restaurant or when you attend such a public speech by Andreas Thiel uh, last Monday. Um, and this certificate is based on so-called 3G. Yeah, <laughs> the ones living in Switzerland know, knows about it. 3G in German means geimpft, getestet, geheilt. So it means vaccinated, healed, and, and tested. Now I realized this spirit has forgotten the fourth G which is gesund, so it's healthy. 
And it, it's not, I mean, it's not a coincidence that they forgot about it because that is exactly what they are never interested in. They are not interested in, well, successful uh, 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 companies. They are not interested in healthy people. So they forgot about it. So I had to welcome the people uh, in, because it, I, I didn't want to become a civil servant, <laughs> basically because it would be my obligation to ask for the certificate. And this is so ridiculous, I, I refuse to do it, but of course I do not want to, to stop the event, which is a, a very interesting event all the time uh, with such interesting speakers that we have. So I said, now I have to welcome you in Avalon, because in Avalon there are different rules. And, I, okay, I must say the public applauded heavily. They were happy about it, but I, I said, okay, with the health, there is also a, a, a responsibility, of course, going along. Nobody speaks about that, that um, taking care of your individual uh, immune system and your resistance to it is actually not only a selfish endeavor, it's also a social thing to do. Because when you, then you cannot give it on, you just refuse it with your immune system. Nobody's talking about that. So I had a little speech in my just short welcoming about that. And I'm a, a bit sad, of course, that I am more or less forced to to make also a little bit of, of marketing for my own state, but circumstances are as they are, and I'm, I'm pretty curious how this future will, will continue to be. Of course, I do not want a, to have any conflict because my only neighbor around the Modelhof, which of course is a very impressive government seat, as you can see, um, uh, is Switzerland. So I'm surrounded by Switzerland. I, I of course hope that the tanks will not uh, uh, coming, but uh, at the moment Switzerland is still quite reasonable with the controls. But with this speech I make public my, my resistance to it. Uh, and maybe that, that was not very cautious, but that's the way it is. Let's be brave in that. Thank you very much for your attention.